commands the audience. Welcome to the main committee room in Parliament House Canberra for our Senate occasional lecture. Uh, we meet here today in Canberra's centenary year where of course people have met for thousands of years. So I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the traditional custodians of this land and pay respect to their elders, past and present. Our uh, speaker today by any standards has an impressive CV, portfolio and indeed repertoire. Uh, Robin Archer is a singer, writer, artistic director and public advocate of the arts, what's known in the arts industry as a quadruple threat. <laughs> she is, uh, thank you very much, I've been workshopping that all night. Um, <laughs> she is a patron of numerous arts organisations and has uh, received herself many prestigious arts awards, most recently a Helpman Award for Best Cabaret Performer 2013. She's the artistic director of The Light in Winter, which she created for Federation Square in Melbourne, which was the winner of the 2012 Australian Event Awards Best Community Event. Robin is deputy chair of the Australia Council, advising on the centenary of ANZAC, and she's also an officer of the Order of Australia. She's here today, of course, in her guise as creative director of the centenary of Canberra, and her chosen topic is reimagining the capital. Please join me in welcoming Robin Archer. Thanks so much. I too begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we meet on, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also acknowledge, especially in this year of Canberra's 100th anniversary, the tens of thousands of years of culture these people continue to maintain and extend. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, apologies for my reduced vocal range. I know I'm always known as good at lowering the tone, but this one's serious. Um, I'm afraid a virus is doing its, uh, its worse. Um, but despite this, there's a lot to say today and I'll attempt a cracking pace to get through it. I preface this lecture by saying that it is the fifth of some seven addresses I give in the second half of the Canberra centenary year, and I'm using each of them to focus on different parts of the centenary program. Together, this series will act as a kind of chronicle of this year, and today, appropriately, for this Senate occasional lecture, I focus on the national and international connections which have been made in 2013, the year in which we celebrate the naming on March the 12th, 1913, of a new national capital for a newly federated nation. Significant national projects were assisted by the Federal Government for the Centenary of Canberra, and in part, I'd like to draw attention to these today and have one last shot at persuading the value, even the necessity, of encouraging and maintaining pride in our national capital. This is not a jingoistic plea, nor, as one journalist was unkind enough to describe at this time last year during the Walkleys, um, which we hosted, as simply an exercise in boosterism, this plea has the national interest at heart. The winner of the 1911 international competition for the design of a new capital city for the new Commonwealth of Australia having been announced in 1912, and subsequent revelations of the interference of the department in the original design later that year having been known, known to the winner, Walter Burley Griffin of Chicago wrote to King O'Malley in January of 1913. I had entered this Australian event to be my first and last competition solely because I have for many years greatly admired the bold radical steps in politics and economies which your country has dared to take and which must, for a long time, set ideals for Europe and America ahead of their possibility of accomplishment. Griffin's perception of the new city was that it would be a symbol of this bold new Commonwealth as both a national and international entity. While much of the 2013 year-long celebration of the city's naming on March the 12th, 1913 has been in Canberra itself and by, with and for Canberrans, there was always a view to the celebration of the national and international dimensions of Canberra. Indeed, the celebration has been ultra-local, regional, national, international and very soon will also be extraterrestrial as a flag bearing the centenary of Canberra logo will be taken by a Japanese astronaut into outer space. <laughs> in fact, I'll begin with the logo, as there's a national aspect to its origin. Four years ago, we invited recent graduates and young professionals, at least one from every state and territory, to participate in a workshop to develop, to develop a new logo. 
These young professionals experienced an excellent induction into both the physical and symbolic realities of their national capital. Mentored in the task by His Excellency Mr Michael Bryce, architect and designer of several very successful logos, they came up with terrific ideas which resulted in a brand marker which has worked very well for us ever since. Its incorporation of Griffin circles and triangles and a 1913 font yielded a sunny energy that still for me reflects that group of bright young designers. A number of these young Australians came to the capital for the first time, with the predictable prejudices of those who have only heard about it second or third hand, and often from those who have never been to the capital or perhaps visited 30 years ago or more, when it was still in its infancy. Some had received worn out messages that there was nothing to do, no young people, a barren place, which I imagine wasn't even true in the pioneering frontier town days. Having freshly experienced the capital as it was in 2009, it has already changed in the last four years, their opinions altered dramatically. One of the participants said, if Canberra is blank, and in any case we challenge that, then it's a blank canvas on which we can draw ourselves in any way we want. He and his young colleagues learnt quickly that even though Canberra may indeed appear empty on the occasional cold high country night, this is a superficial impression. They became convinced of the richness beneath, in the history of the capital, in its collections and achievements, and to what extent all that can be drawn on for inspiration and fresh, innovative content. This also emerged as an emphasis for the Australian Theatre Forum, which was hosted by the centenary this year and which drew eager participants from all over the country. The collections here were acknowledged as rich resources for further creativity, not just in theatre, but for film, dance, literature and the visual arts. Taking the time to invest in more than a superficial scan inevitably leads visitors to the conclusion that this capital, like other national capitals, represents an invaluable asset not only in the cultural treasures it holds on behalf of the Australian people, but in encouraging participatory democracy via an understanding of the high ideals, vast aspirations and history of achievement in arts and science, those two mainstays of Clause 27 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, upon all of which the capital has been built. And that asset is precious. Let me reference just one of the reasons why. During the lead-up to this year's centenary, the Australian Financial Review published the results of a survey of young Australians who were asked about systems of government. Oddly and worryingly, in an age when a kind of cultural democracy is all-pervasive – you can vote on anything as your favourite film, piece of music, performer, etc. – and you can blog your views to the world to hell with expert opinion – a number of these young Australians said that they didn't particularly value democracy and that another system might serve Australia just as well. The word dictatorship was in fact mentioned. This is quite different for young new Australians, many of whom seek residence or asylum here precisely because of our democratic system and the belief that they might get a fair go here. But if there is complacency in young second or longer generation Australians, then I believe that strong signs and symbols of democracy are important and believe that the national capital is well placed to provide them. Much of this was discussed in our National Press Club conversation, The Future Journey of Democracy, a collaboration between the Centenary and the Canberra Multicultural Community Forum, moderated by ABC's Geraldine Doog. There was a simultaneous conversation, both linked by satellite, at Federation Square in Melbourne for the festival I direct there, The Light in Winter. The voices heard on the night were Australian voices of diverse cultural background – Indigenous Australian, Muslim, Somalian, Iranian, Indian, Burmese, Greek and many more. A valuable understanding quickly occurred – that the tools of democracy are already different throughout the world and that the concept of democracy needs to be flexible enough to morph in order to meet the needs of new and evolving democracies in places like North Africa, Burma and Somalia, and even countries like India, whose enormous population still tr struggles to achieve more effective participatory democracy. The key was thought to be inclusion. 
And one of our many challenges in nurturing and maintaining effective democracy is to ensure that these kinds of conversations, especially those which include the culturally diverse voices of Australia, replace the complacency which clearly dominates the social and political engagement or lack thereof amongst any number of Australians, certainly not just young Australians, whose democratic responsibilities are often neglected. This focus on national symbolism has long been part and parcel of what the PACER program does annually for around 160,000 year six school children from all around the country. For these young people, as for many recent new Australian residents, the capital makes for an inspirational visit. The curiosity they display at the Museum of Australian Democracy and the obvious awe and respect they feel at the Australian War Memorial are two of the more obvious signs that the capital's symbolic role is functional and powerful. One of the ongoing projects which has reached far further than the borders of the ACT is the Canberra Diaspora. The project acknowledged the transitory nature of a national capital in which for more than 100 years there has been a continuous process of movement in and out, from indigenous habitation and ceremonial meeting and pilgrimages to the higher country, to pastoralists who then had to be moved on, then surveyors, engineers, builders and all the service providers that entails, to defence personnel, medical professionals, scientists, educators, students, politicians, public servants, diplomats, artists and sports persons and at any time the 25% of the population which comes from a non-English speaking background. We appealed particularly to those who had been here, had served and made their contribution and gone away again. The dedicated website for the portrait for the Canberra diaspora has stories from all over Australia and the world and I quote just one in support of arguing the importance of the symbolic role of the capital. Jackie Martin now lives in Melbourne, and at the time she uploaded her video, she was head of marketing at La Trobe University. If you go to the website, you'll see she describes very funny stories about her first trips to Canberra, once mistaken as a prostitute and once in the middle of summer nats. Um, kind of extra, it's a very, very funny story. Both times she vowed she would never return again to Canberra. On the third visit, she was strong-armed to the War Memorial for the first time, and she describes turning around in the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, looking down Anzac Parade across Lake Burley Griffin to Old Parliament House, to New Parliament House, and she says something like, I burst into tears and knew for the first time in my 30-something years in this country what it meant to be Australian. She then has a little coda that says she was then invited for a job here, came and met her husband here, so happily ever after. There is a massive unrealised potential for the capital to be seen and used even more in this way. I suggest that, paradoxically, one of the biggest thorns in the side of such ambition is the tendency for some of those involved in political life, both politicians and press, to dis Canberra for very dubious and ill-considered reasons. I'll say a bit more about that later, but would add now that I also believe the whingeocracy is probably in any case in its decline, since for younger generations and more recent Australian citizens, this is where the capital is and does, happily for them and for many of us, have the kind of symbolic status demanded of a capital. With regard to young visitors, I should add that Canberra has welcomed many more young people from all over Australia this year. To mention just a few, the Tournament of Minds National Finals saw hundreds of bright youngsters engaged in finding performative solutions to complex challenges. The Youth Parliament again considered the big issues for Australia. And in the sporting domain, major gatherings such as the Kangaroo Cup and Special Olympic Swimming added to the capital's first time elite sport program, for which the Australian Institute of Sport is the national centre, participatory sports, for which the Canberra community also holds per capita first place in the nation. At the other end of the age scale, in the participatory stakes, the many masters events held in Canberra this year demonstrated an enthusiasm for holding signature national competitions in the capital. Record numbers were recorded for many, including the masters rowing event on Lake Burley Griffin, wildly underrated it seems for such purposes. Not so with Mount Stromlo, now rated as the home of mountain biking in Australia, and how good it was to hear Canberran Caroline Buchanan named last weekend as Australian Cyclist of the Year 2013. In that elite sporting realm, Canberra proved itself to be a successful host to major international events. 
Golf Australia is now quoted as saying that the Handa Australian Women's Golf Open here for the first time at Royal Canberra was the best ever. The first ever international cricket match held in Canberra's history, hard to believe but true, between Australia and the West Indies under brand spanking new lights at Manuka was a sellout success. Similar crowds and expertise in production and delivery were reported for the Australian New Zealand Rugby League test, the Brumbies versus British and Irish Lions and the Netball test. Add in all those Masters events, plus the National Indigenous Golf Competition coming up soon, and together they demonstrate the capacity for the capital to host a wide range of major events, not for the pleasure of Canberrans alone, not only for them, but as a sign of the increasing sophistication of this still young city and of the well-rounded culture of this place. In the past, Canberra has been falsely represented as nothing but politicians and public servants. But one of the main legacies of 2013 will be some powerful busting of that dated myth. That Canberra has the liveliest and most participatory sporting community per capita in Australia is important for Australians to understand about their capital. That it has a lively and active Indigenous community which continues to preserve and expand traditional culture and practice is important for Australians to understand. How many were aware prior to this centenary year and the profile it has created that within 40 minutes drive from their capital and within the ACT borders, we can view ancient rock art sites and hear the stories of those who once traveled long distances to observe law in the high country, to understand craft and food gathering practice and how the land was cared for. The enthusiasm and support across the board of both Canberrans and the record number of visitors to the capital this year surely justifies ambitions not only for first-class sports facilities in the capital, but also new performing arts facilities. This is the role that the Kennedy Centre plays in Washington and that place called the Australian Forum, where the biggest and boldest ideas are debated. I would argue, as a South Australian, that these are not local facilities only for the benefit of Canberrans, but constitute infrastructure, I hope undeniably excellent in architectural ambition, which strengthens the capital and makes us ever prouder of the way in which it symbolises our noblest aspirations in arts, sports, ideas, science, research and innovation of all kind. In that case, these projects demand federal government participation, and at the same time, they enable the continuing development of a city which Walter and Marion Marnie Griffin imagined 100 years ago. And as Prime Minister Andrew Fisher expressed at the time, here on this spot, in the near future, and I hope the distant future too, the best thoughts of Australia will be given expression to, both in legislative and administrative acts, I hope this city will be the seat of learning as well as of politics, and it will also be the home of art. The federal government's generous contribution to the new National Arboretum Canberra already ensures an enduring legacy of the centenary year, one which is beyond the ambitions of political terms and indeed beyond the ambitions of any single lifetime. It will be at its best 100 years from now. I hope that one of the overarching legacies of this centenary year will be the stimulus of a continuing collaboration between the federal and territory governments to allow this young city to continue to mature for the benefit of all Australians. While the capital has been enriched throughout 2013 by a program which has celebrated the history and the achievements of this still young city, its present capabilities, capacities and rich cultural landscape, its symbolic role as the seat of federal government and thus its connection to the nation and the world have also been firmly in mind and ever present throughout the year. A priority in program was Indigenous content. I detailed this content in my Schumann lecture, the first of these lectures, in July this year, and it can be found online at canberra100.com.au and also at the ANU Centre for European Studies. The Indigenous program demonstrated not only the richness of local Aboriginal culture and allowed many local traditional stories to be told and talent to be profiled, but saw Indigenous Australians from all over the country welcomed here and meeting local communities. They came from Roburn in the Pilbara, from Elko and Torres Strait Islands, East Arnhem Land, Central Australia, Brisbane, Melbourne, New South Wales and South Australia. <clears throat> this was a vast and rare program made possible by the federal government's contribution to the centenary and included Seven Sisters Songlines, a collaboration with the INU's 
Diana James as part of a huge survey of performative and visual representation of that story which is told, sung, danced and painted by Indigenous Australians across a vast sweep from west to east coasts of Australia. These collected representations are building to an even more comprehensive survey in future years, and we were honoured to support one of the first major manifestations directed by Wesley Enoch, a Stradbrook Island man and first Indigenous artistic director of a state theatre company in Queensland. The performances were held at the National Museum of Australia, which holds within its architecture the symbolic red line which points us directly to Central Australia, whence this particular version of the story and its owners and performers came. Acknowledgement of original habitation and custodianship for tens of thousands of years constituted an appropriate prelude to a celebration of the energy and activity of the last 100. In a nod to the original quest for a site for the new capital, we ensured this inclusion of the borders in an early salute to the surveyors, and this weekend and next to the ACT's unmade edges in community artist projects at Thawa, Uriara, Hall, Pialago, Oaks Estate and Stromlo. The surrounding region has also seen activity acknowledged by the centenary in Goulburn for the 150th anniversary of their status as Australia's first inland city, Queenbeyan in its 175th year, Leeton, also designed by Walter Burley Griffin and celebrating 100 years in 2013, Yass, the Snowy Mountains, Bega and Jarvis Bay, while the Rec Bay community presented a superb exhibition, Wind Songs and Waterlines, at Canberra Museum and Gallery and at Lanyon. Beyond the borders and the nearby sites, many of which were candidates around 1910 for the new capital, the connections to regional Australia have been significant. Because of the role I undertook here as Creative Director of the Centenary of Canberra, I have had to learn and understand much more about Canberra and its history, present and future. I first visited Canberra often but fleetingly for family reasons. But since my second Canberra phase, a much deeper encounter with the place 20 years ago, I understood that whatever opinion might be expressed outside, possibly in ignorance of the real Canberra, the minute they are invited to the capital, there is a sense of pilgrimage and, whether in celebration or in protest, by invitation or intent, a sense of occasion. Since the time when Canberra gave me the priceless opportunity to add another string to my professional bow, that of artistic and creative direction, I have understood that to be invited to the capital just to join a meeting or to come here to lobby and persuade is a matter of pride to any Australian. There is an instant sense that one's ideas, one's work, one's life matters on a national scale. Any artist I invited to participate in the National Festival of Australian Theatre was intensely proud to show their work here, and so it was this year for all those companies which comprised Collected Works Australia, the Canberra Theatre Centre's 2013 subscription program, which included works from every state and territory in the country. This season included the multi helpman award-winning The Secret River, which was co-commissioned by the Centenary along with the Sydney Theatre Company and the Sydney and Perth Festivals. It also included Circa's Wunderkammer from Queensland, Shrine by Tim Winton from Black Swan in Perth, and Big Art's Hip Bone Sticking Out from Roeburn, As We Forgive from Tasmania, Thursday from Brink in South Australia, Bell Shakespeare's Henry IV, which premiered in Canberra and for which John Bell was a Helpman Award nominee, Ilba Jerry's Jack Charles versus the Crown from Victoria, Home at the End from the ACT, and Willem and Aiui and the Seven Pamanui, the first ever theatre show from the Tiwi Islands. State and territory governments contributed generously to ensure this remarkable season. It spoke volumes for the challenges we continue to face in touring the very best of our theatrical and choreographic endeavours for the pleasure and enlightenment of all Australians. We produce so much good work and tell so many superb stories in such skilled and awe-inspiring ways, yet fail to ensure that the best of this creative endeavour is shared with all Australians. Their efforts are largely confined to local seasons only. One of the many enthusiastic reviews of The Secret River declared it unmissable, yet even with sold-out seasons in only three cities, most Australians will never see it. The season for Canberra Centenary displayed the quality of the national wealth of performing arts, which could be shared annually with so many more if we could establish an effective and suitably funded touring mechanism, at very least to all capitals, if not regional centres as well. <coughs> 
The flip side of that national coin is, of course, the nurturing, encouragement and profiling of the creativity arising from the regions themselves. One of the most profound connections we made between the regions and the capital this year was via a project called One River, also made possible by the federal government's assistance. You can still explore this project by searching One River online. The website will be archived by the National Library of Australia for at least the next five years. The project in <coughs> evolved from the moment I learned that Canberra is the biggest city in the Murray-Darling Basin and that the Murrumbidgee runs through the ACT to join the waters which eventually flow to the mouth at Gulwa. The reality of this mighty river system provided a way for Canberra to unite four states in a territory during the centenary year. My motivation for the project came from a personal place of long-held affinity with the river. My mother was born on the banks of the Murray at Cadell, where her father operated the Cadell Morgan punt. I have been aware of the river and its people all my life. On my father's side, my late aunt had once been the mayor of Goolwa, and I'd been aware of the silting issues at the mouth for many years. I had a mentoring role for some years at the Mildura Wentworth Arts Festival and as aware, was aware of the pain which diminishing and inconsistent water allocation issues caused. I had a heartfelt pull to river issues and for the first time unexpectedly here, the centenary of Canberra gave me the opportunity to create a conversation wider and deeper than the divisive question of water allocation. This meta project linked many individual projects the length and breadth of the Murray-Darling through Queensland, New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria and South Australia. In this respect, it means the debunking of another myth about the national capital that is remote. What other city can claim such physical links to four states and a territory? The project also demonstrates the liveliness of remote communities throughout the system, and these are evident on the website. The main focus of the project eventuated in 10 artist projects in Augathella, Mitchell, Burke, Canberra, Narandera, Sandigo and Bori Creek, Lakes Mungo, Hatter and Hawthorne, Mildura Wentworth, Albury Wodonga, Murray Bridge and Goolwa Murray Mouth. These projects have demonstrated the power of the arts to connect communities and to allow stories to be told and shared in lively, creative and engaging ways. Thousands of river people have been involved. An installation, Treasures of the River in Augathella, saw a call out from school teacher and emerging artist Joanna Sutton for historical photographs from residents in the districts. Working with students, Joanna in turn select, selected some of these photographs, turned them into postcards and mounted them as a large scale installation. The project brought this small community together to relish the artwork, to appreciate the presence of the artist in their town and to add value to an appreciation of where they live. The local tourist information office is going to sell the packaged cards and there has been a subsequent geocaching project to uncover the secrets of the Warrego. The artist told me with genuine passion that the project had brought her and her husband into contact for the first time with a comprehensive range of the community who had been keen to show their photos and have the conversation. The conversation was also extended to experts in a series of symposia which included water experts and beautiful films made by Malcolm McKinnon, all of which can be found on the website. Artist Jude Roberts worked with residents in Mitchell to place large stretches of paper at the waterline of the Maranoa River. The water itself made the marks all different at different sites and these huge scrolls eventually became, became the materials for beautiful installations, both abstract yet at the same time singing a highly local, authentic and organic song. These were seen in Mitchell, the Maranoa Gallery and Canberra. These projects all but all demanded conversations with many locals. They all proved to be galvanising for their communities. More importantly, all those artists, plus family and friends, gathered in Canberra at the Belconnen Arts Centre, where they were able to talk with each other and see evidence of each other's project. This links a bit to the previous point about distance and the arts. It may not be well understood that this kind of gathering is a rarity in Australia. Time and distance inevitably prevents the majority of our artists from ever seeing the work of other artists and, more importantly, meeting and talking with them. Linked up projects like this, as well as genre specific festivals, provide a vital platform for the understanding and advancement of our artists and their work. Taking advantage of the digital age can also assist in this. An effective and wide reaching national broadband network could offer multiple enhanced opportunities for connecting to projects, process, outcomes and dialogue in real time. 
In this project, a shared notion of river life was palpable and respectful, and CEO of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, Dr Rhonda Dixon, said that they would no doubt draw on these projects and the notion of shared values and memories in their ongoing work. This project makes a positive contribution to many and varied communities who have been perceived and portrayed for so many years as embattled, yet have so much in common. One of the key figures in the creative team was filmmaker Malcolm McKinnon, who reported this. Above all, the experience of working on One River prompted me to think, as I frequently do, about the disconnect between, on the one hand, the deeply rooted and often heartfelt common wisdom of people whose lives are truly connected with the rivers in some way or another, and the abstracted and politicised realm of public policy and planning on the other. He continued, this for me and for so many people I encountered in my travels across the basin constitutes one of the great conundrums and great frustrations. And it raises, of course, the inevitable question of where do we look for leadership and inspiration? At a political level, my experience working on the project made painfully evident once again the negative impacts of parochial state governments in the management of an ecosystem spanning multiple jurisdictions. Aside from that, I was moved by the enormous generosity of people willing to share their stories with a complete stranger and the openness of people to talk about places they cared deeply about and to embrace the opportunity for storytelling that the project represented. We must bear in mind that these were artist projects that happened through the centenary of Canberra program, which had a care for and an eye to the country as a whole. There are lessons to be learned about the power of the arts to tell the most important stories and tell them in a way which strikes a chord not just with art lovers, but with anyone who can be drawn into the content of these projects. In the case of One River, a long string of river communities were drawn through the arts into reflections on their place, their history, present and future. Nothing could be more important for participation in the democratic process than to understand country and to connect as community. There was a subsequent event of importance under the One River banner, a ceremony at dusk on the banks of the Murrumbidgee within ACT borders, saw the sharing of song and dance between traditional custodians of that land, Paul House and the Ngambri dancers, seen here just this week at the opening of Parliament, and Naranjeri elder Major Sumner and the Taukin Jerry dancers from the mouth of the Murray near Gulwa. The tangible connection between the two places was made movingly manifest when the Southerners offered a whale dance and we realised that whales will swim in the water we saw running fast and clear that night in the Murrumbidgee. In an interview, Major Sumner, who has also danced the Darling in the past, described a tradition that goes back millennia, which had vanished after European occupation, but has not been lost forever. He said, it's a long ways, but our people were involved in ceremonies, including the Murrumbidgee, all the rivers that connect up to the Murray and the Darling, and all the water from here eventually gets down to our country. So ceremonies were right along the rivers, and all we are doing is putting the energy back in and getting the ceremonies going again. The One River Project was launched in November 2012 as part of Goolwa's City of Culture program, and at that time, Ngunnawal Ranger and cultural advisor Adrian Brown had been south to meet Major Sumner, known as Uncle Moogie, for the first time, and began then to learn something about that country. The river ceremony emerged from that meeting and via One River. The lessons for future pathways to genuine processes of reconciliation are many. They require respect for the protocols demanded and the individuals involved. They simply need the long time it really takes. And the best results often occur through arts and culture, which are an integral part of Indigenous Australian life, not a luxury leisure, as they can still be regarded by some Australians. As Central Australian senior law woman Inna Winchy Williamson said of the Seven Sisters Songlines project, this is how we look after strongly this big, important creation story and teach the young ones who come after us so that they can look after it in their turn and teach their children the many to follow. This was a theme that emerged throughout the Indigenous program, most recently through a very small project to allow ACT local Duncan Smith and his Wurundjeri dancers to develop the Biami creation story beyond just song and dance, which they'd done already, to a theatrical form for children. It had its first showing at the Centenary Children's Festival in Glebe Park a few weekends ago, and its potential is solid. As examples of further exchange on the national and international basis, 
Elders from Roban had come to Canberra for a development phase of the big art work hip bone sticking out. In the rehearsal rooms of the Canberra Theatre Centre, I saw that group of elders and youngsters share song and dance with Duncan and his family. The indefatigable choreographer Elizabeth Cameron Dalman, whose company Miramu and its studio sit at the edge of Lake George, created Morning Star with longtime collaborator Torres Strait Islander dancer Albert David, and invited East Arnhem Land dancers, including the great dancer and songman Jakapara Munyaran, to join them. They premiered the work at the National Gallery of Australia and presented excerpts as part of Canberra's big birthday bash around the lake on the 11th of March. More recently, excerpts have been seen in Taiwan, where Elizabeth has long established connections. There has been more to all this than is understood when one simply claims a huge and comprehensive Indigenous cultural program. And I might just add that Canberra resident and a member of the centenary of Canberra's informal Indigenous cultural reference group, Jennifer Kamari Martiniello, had a remarkable year with a brilliant exhibition at the Canberra Glassworks and work also featured at the ANU and at the Canberra Museum and Art Gallery, the awarding of a prestigious two-year Australia Council Fellowship at the Red Ochre Awards presented at the Sydney Opera House and ultimately winning the overall 2013 Telstra Indigenous Art Award presented in Darwin. What a remarkable list of achievements in just one year, and especially for a local Canberran. Also in this year, Indigenous media have really shone. The support of our program uh, had from the National Indigenous Times and NITV exceeded all our expectations. In other programs of national significance, the Museum of the Long Weekend saw vintage caravans driven from 40 different spots around the country to meet, to meet on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin in Canberra. They came from as far afield as Robin and the Pilbara, from Cairns and from the south of Tasmania. This was a joyous gathering of beautiful vintage vehicles, many of which had been curated by artists to tell tales of the caravanners and their long weekends and long journeys. The decor of 40s, 50s and 60s was exquisite. And again, these people talked to each other, visited each other's caravans and shared stories. This is very much the ethos of caravanning life. It was pure pleasure for those of us who have such a romantic notion of a caravan life we may never have experienced ourselves, I include myself. We have perhaps just observed our parents or aunts and uncles and grandparents living that particular dream. But Scott Rankin, the artistic director of Big Art, has, and that's a quite remarkable company doing incredible projects across the country, Scott has a deeper philosophical underpinning of this project. He believes that in this era of apparent necessity of ever increasing productivity, it's on every lip every day, many governments and businesses neglect the positive values of leisure, that nation building happens just as effectively at rest as at hard bitten, hard nosed work. There are, of course, multiple examples of the truth of this. Walt Whitman, the American writer, quietly wandered the woods and came back to write the wise words that would influence millions thereafter, including Walter Burley and Marion Marnie Griffin and their plans for this capital city. Canberra still sits within a green landscape, very much because of the kind of philosophies which Whitman and others espoused, philosophies which he developed in his walks in the woods. British composer Edward Elgar wandered endlessly in his nearby forests, then sat down and wrote almost perfectly, with few alterations, the entire melodic lines and orchestrations which he had imagined in the wilds, of musical works which became emblematic for Britain. These are nation-building moments which began with the creativity of artists not at their desks or in their studios, but wandering in nature. I think we all know of ourselves, and certainly it's true for me, that the best ideas come flooding in at unexpected moments of relative emptiness in the mind. When the mind is cluttered and over busy, genuine creativity rarely emerges. Scott has a great point, and for all the focus on family in an age when the concept of consistent, stable nuclear families is so challenged by the reality of family breakdown and break up, why would we not look more carefully at the exquisite bonding as well as the learning which always occurs on a good holiday? 
This ability to relax, to talk together around the fire at night, is surely an important factor in the development of healthy and engaged societies, something we would wish for all citizens, yet so obviously absent for so many driven in a work, work, work society. This simple device, a project around caravans, stimulates profound considerations for national life. National institutions played an important role in celebrating Canberra's centenary. Not only the National Gallery of Australia and the Australian War Memorial, but the Mint, the Australian National Botanic Gardens, the Royal Military College Duntroon, the National Portrait Gallery, which made huge efforts to connect its themes to the chronologically themed sequence of the centenary year, and perhaps most significantly, the National Museum of Australia with its glorious days Australia 1913, the National Australian Archives with its design 29, and the National Library of Australia with Dream of a Century, the Griffins in Australia. The Museum of Australian Democracy continues to present its year-long art of influence and amongst many other exhibitions allowed us to see Arthur Boyd through a new political perspective. And this Parliament House celebrated its 25th year, especially through the beautiful publication Interwoven by Pamil Berg, who had originally commissioned the art and craft for this house, and through Monument, a ballet commissioned by the Centenary of Canberra from the Australian Ballet to celebrate this anniversary. The work was choreographed by Gary Stewart and designed by Mary Moore, both from Adelaide, with music by ex-Canberran Huey Benjamin. It was extremely well received by the public and in reviews and we are confident after its world premiere in Canberra this year it will be seen further afield in years to come, as will the commissioned musical work by Andrew Schultz, Symphony No. 3 Century, which had its world premiere here on the 11th of March. While much of the centenary's arts and programs sought to profile the many excellent qualities of local artists, it should also be noted that Canberra saw the work of other major performing arts companies in addition to the Australian Ballet. The Sydney Theatre Company, Bell Shakespeare, Bangara, Black Swan Theatre Company, Sydney Dance and the Australian Chamber Orchestra all gave terrific guest appearances. And all these added to the list of those national institutions based here in the capital. In addition to the Australian Theatre Forum, the heart of it, Canberra also hosted Fear No Art, the Australian Performing Arts Centres Association's national conference, which saw practitioners, producers and administrators from all over the country meet and debate in Canberra. The project Portrait of a Nation acknowledged the streets of Canberra as a dictionary of Australian biography and invited locals to research the famous and often forgotten Australians their street is named after and to celebrate them. The project had student project connections through the National Portrait Gallery and national connections to other places where the name and the person also occurred. The year has also been outstanding in terms of architecture and design. Not only the new publication 100 Canberra Houses, which gives an alternative history of the capital through its domestic architecture, and the publication of a noble history of engineering here in the last 100 years, but in terms of actual construction, such as Nishi, perhaps the most sustainable apartment building in the country, the new Embassy of the Netherlands with similar environmental credentials, the boundless all-ability playground being established on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin through the generosity of contributions by public servants, the naming of the Centenary Women's and Children's Hospital, a new National Rock Garden, also Lakeside, the new Centenary Garden, that's S-C-E-N-T, Centenary Garden at Hennessy House, the re-establishment of Constitution Avenue, the Centenary Trail, just opened, and of course the magnificent National Arboretum Canberra, the face of the city has changed. Designers have been actively engaged throughout the year, especially in the legacy of good design project for which local craftspersons pitched prototypes which could be reproduced in number. A suite of five objects were then produced as quality memorabilia of the centenary. They've been selling like hotcakes and it seems certain that this craft reproduction model will leave a legacy for future years. Architecture and design students have been engaged through projects like Shine a Light and particularly through two important hypotheticals, the Lodge on the Lake, a new lodge for a Prime Minister whom we know no Prime Minister will ever actually vote the money to get a new house for themselves, so we're going to have to do it Australia ourselves and we need an architectural show place for any Prime Minister. And the other one was called the Capathetical. The Capathetical was an international design competition for a hypothetical capital for Australia in the 20 
21st century. Administered on our behalf by the Australian Institute of Architects, the competition asked art architects and designers to put themselves in the shoes of those 1911 competitors who responded to the original international competition for the new capital. We demanded of these competitors that they engaged with the history of the original competition, and in particular with questions about what the capital of a democratic co country should be, what it should contain and what it should symbolise. We also provided provocations. If this is the Asian century, should our capital be physically closer to Asia? If the Australian people eventually did say yes to a republic, would there be the call for a new capital? And where would you start in any case? There were more than 1,200 registrations of interest from nearly 30 countries, and in the end, 120 actual entries from 27 countries. The international multipliers represent a very sizeable promotional aspect of the competition. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands more people around the world now the, know that Canberra is the capital of Australia, perhaps for the first time. <laughs> the expert jury reported that the highest on the list of concerns were predictably but satisfyingly sustainability and the nature of democracy. The ultimate winner of the $70,000 first prize was Ecoscape Australia, based in Fremantle. It recommended maintaining the capital in Canberra, but through an ingenious set of references to the Griffin design, connected Canberra to a northern base, which would be the administrative headquarters for Asian and Indigenous development. The hypothetical northern capital displayed heroic design for sustainability and great beauty on the shores of Lake Argyle in the Kimberley. The expert jury, chaired by Professor Barbara Norman said, the top three entries form an important and integrated narrative about the future challenges and the nation's capital that include better connecting to the North, our indigenous communities in that region and to Southeast Asia, recognising and responding to extreme weather and climate change and living with our environment and embracing regional Australia as a critical consideration in our strategic national vision. Again, a simple competition steeped in the history of the national capital allowed a complex dialogue about Australia's futures to evolve in a virtual space of international dimensions. And on other international fronts, actual rather than virtual, the centenary was equally active. Local artists, DJs, Dopus and Rochambeau, said of their centenary exchange project in Brasilia, that other planned capital where they performed at the Sena Contemporanea, we cannot express what a fantastic opportunity it was and the new creative spark it has given us for writing new music. Their exchange counterpart, Sistema Criaina from Brasilia, performed here in Canberra and were equally happy to have had this experience. The project has opened up new possibilities for exchange in the future, especially as Australia increasingly looks with business, educational and cultural eyes towards countries like Brazil. Jill Bradley is the award-winning British artist and creator of our sole directly commissioned international work, City of Trees, which was both a recorded sound project, which you can download from the Canberra 100 website, and an exhibition at the National Library of Australia. Jill said some terrific things in her report back to us. There can be few honours greater than to be invited to take part in the centenary of a country's capital city. I still have to pinch myself that this was so and this privilege was mine. Like Canberra, perhaps, the show, and this was the exhibition at the gallery, didn't give, it way, give itself away up front, but required patience and discovery. For me, the city is as much what you bring to it as it brings to you. In my own humble opinion, I believe that this is what Morta and Marion had in mind. The city they created, whilst full of symbolism, is not an easy read. It's a layering of events, both personal and collective. It is the people who bring content to place by way of symbiotic exchange. The city creeps up on you slowly, but once it's under your skin, it is so forever. I think on a deep psychological level, this has been my abiding experience of the city. It's in the water, the light and the air and the trees. Ronan Moss of Canberra Lab, that exciting collective of young architects, participated in a large-scale installation of photographs at New York's Photoville Festival quite recently, as local Canberra photographers had such work as the Belco boy, the tattooed boy, shown against the New York skyline. Ronan reported enormous pride and pleasure to be able to make a project there. He said, it represents the changing spirit of Canberra and the growing confidence of a place like Belconnen with its potent mix of students, public servants and communities from around the globe. The work was about Canberra seen through a contemporary lens. 
And in the capital itself, the recent windows to the world acknowledge that often hidden aspect of Canberra. It's around 100 diplomatic missions and the incredible cultural richness they re represent. The Dean of Ambassadors and Commissioners, Pedro Delgado, Ambassador for Argentina, reported a sellout success of this spring program, which allowed embassies to open their gates to allow the public to discover their gardens, architecture, food and other aspects of culture. It's a no-brainer and hopefully will continue in future years. The participation of the diplomatic community has been exceptional all year, with the exceptional contributions to the program of the Canberra Symphony Orchestra, the anniversary of the unique relationship with France at Tilopia Park School, a new embassy of the Netherlands, and their hosting of a solar car team, and soon a quartet of the Royal Concertgebouw coming up. And there were so many other uh, contributions from the diplomatic corps. And within the community, our collaboration with the Canberra Multicultural Forum saw not only the important forum on the future journey of democracy, but also just weekend, last weekend, the Harmony Bus Tours, which took participants to diverse places of culture and worship throughout Canberra, including synagogue, Buddhist temple, indigenous cultural centre and mosque. It's not a view that's normally thought of about Canberra. On the international front, we connected with India, where centenary historian Dr. Dave Heaton and I were part of a memorial at Walter Burley Griffin's gravesite in Lucknow and a design seminar in Delhi, and with London, as I delivered the Arthur Boyd Memorial Lecture at Australia House, and we met the late, the late Lord Denman, whose predecessor had laid Canberra's foundation stone. This resulted in the current Lord and Lady Denman's visit for the March celebrations. I launched the centenary program at the end of last year um, in Washington and in Chicago, where I was privileged to be shown much of Walter and Marion's architecture by that city's cultural historian, every city should have one. And we had those artist projects in Brasilia and New York and performances from troops from sister cities Nara and Beijing, as well as from Dili on the occasion of the re-signing of the friendship agreement with the ACT. So, with all this great good news and such overwhelmingly positive results for the centenary of Canberra, I hesitate to return to the detractors, but alas, I must, as the year has barely six more weeks to run and my opportunities for advocating the importance of Canberra, though I shall always be its champion, will clearly diminish. One of the chief goals of the centenary of Canberra was to increase pride in the national capital. But we have to ask, why would that even need to be a goal? 100 years after the capital's naming and a good 70 years since the start of its establishment. Well, in one of his first public statements, a recently elected member of this parliament stated that he wouldn't be spending much time here because Canberra is a sterile place. The Prime Minister himself said just a couple of weeks ago, we don't want MPs hanging around Canberra all the time. Now, in my opinion, this is fair enough. We do understand the need for elected members to be at home, working in their constituencies and gathering information nation and worldwide. But unfortunately, people outside the capital often misinterpret statements like these as, why would you want to hang around Canberra? Such sentiments have been reinforced time and again by the leaders of our country. Prime Minister Howard refused to live in the capital, and Prime Minister Keating, who did, called it Australia's worst mistake. Prime Minister Fraser agreed with him. And apart from the Sydney Morning Herald's architecture writer Elizabeth Farrelly, who continues her naive wish for Canberra to be Sydney, there is another small gaggle of curmudgeons who diss the capital at every opportunity. Given the opportunity to have observed these detractors at close hand for four years and more by now, I suspect what links them all and the reason for their unabated spleen may be political disappointment, mainly blokes who didn't achieve the political success or access or influence they sought and blame the city for that self-perceived failure rather than themselves and the choices they may have made. I wonder if newly elected members and members of the press gallery get an introduction or an induction to the city that will play host to their workplace for the next few years. And if not, I wonder if they could be given that opportunity. It is often said that members only ever see inside this house and their own apartments. Again, one understands the pressure of work, meetings, late night sittings, and the desire to get home to family and constituency, but I just wonder if they ever get real insight to the city and the people beyond these walls. Canberra doesn't deserve just to be used and abused. 
Hundreds of thousands of Australian citizens work to keep the city functional. The drivers, plumbers, gardeners, doctors, engineers, painters, artists, sports trainers and public servants, all of them work hard to ensure the maintenance of a fine city which has proved for decades now its capacity to host federal government and a hundred international diplomatic missions as well as fine scientific institutions and the care and protection of the nation's cultural treasures. There are good restaurants here, beautiful wineries, terrific local galleries and musea, and expanding zones of young cool. And I speak not as a Canberran, but as an Adelaidean who has lived for long periods in Sydney, Melbourne and London and enjoyed bigger cities like New York, Paris, Tokyo for lengthy periods and visited scores more. I know what I'm talking about when I say that Canberra is a fine city with many sophisticated advantages, yet with the pleasures of living in a relaxed and very green country town. And many Australians also understand this. Maybe a leaf should be taken from the current Governor-General's crowded book. She is a devout Queenslander with serious national and international responsibilities, yet she supports and nurtures Canberra and life and culture with enthusiastic time and commitment. She has been an incredibly generous supporter of the centenary, as has our patron, the former Governor-General, Sir William Dean. The loud, negative, and sometimes influential handful are in fact out of touch with what the majority of Australians thought about Canberra more than six years ago when planning for the centenary began. The majority of a large sample believing that the centenary of Canberra was a celebration for all Australians, and so it has proved to be, with a genuine feeling of connection to the capital frequently and variously expressed throughout 2013. The artists, scientists, Elite sports persons, masters sports participants, young sports participants, vintage car and caravan owners, the 500 humans who constituted the human brochure, which tweeted and blogged tens of thousands of positive messages about the city. The record number of participants and visitors in Canberra this year all agree that Canberra is a pleasurable and entertaining city, safe, full of smarts and clean high country air. More importantly, even as we all rightfully and dutifully take an excited interest in what goes on within these walls, the nation building projects which are decided here and the debate which occurs around them, we also need to acknowledge that Canberra is a city and a place worthy of its status as the site where all this occurs. My hope is that we increasingly see that pride reflected from the top from up here and communicated honestly, not in ignorance, through Australian and global media. Thank you. Thanks very, thanks very much, Robin. Um, we do have some time for some questions. If uh, anybody would like to uh, uh, step up to the microphones just here, so we can just behind you, so we can catch your voice for the uh, for the audio record of this event, we'll, which will no doubt uh, echo through the internets forever. Um, oh dear. Please. <laughs> Robin, all those things that you've outlined about what I've missed this year. Just a simple question. Can you please just rerun the whole year? Yeah, about another 60 million would do it. No problem. <laughs> not, not quite in our budget here today, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. this one. Please. If anyone else has any questions, just step up to uh, one of the microphones, please. My name is Marion O'Hara Cossatz, and Robin, it was just tremendous to be here. Thank you for it. People, we are the lucky ones who live in Canberra. We can do all of this. We have to resist the media using the word Canberra when they mean the federal government. <laughs> I'm suggesting the two magnificent books which are available in the courtyard, in the pet foyer here, are they being posted free to every school and every public library in Australia? Uh, 
the simple answer to the question is no, but it can all be accessed through the website and uh, we still have a few of them left. So, And they'll, yeah. they'll be in libraries. And Everybody things. says available through the website, but there's still so many people who cannot access it, aware of that. But my main thinking is possibly corporate bodies or philanthropists, obviously as tax deductions, could they be encouraged to have photographed the unmissable type activities of which you spoke so that they can then be recorded on a DVD and made available, maybe at a cost, maybe free, to the ABC and then available to every school, every senior people, to Australia via TV. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Um, there are a couple of things there. Um, as to your first question about the media using Canberra as a substitute for government, in fact, our research showed that when it was bad news, it was Canberra. When it was good news, it was the federal government. <laughs> it's what the media did. However, it was the subject of my National Press Club address in the middle of um, 2012, and it hasn't done a blind bit of good, I can tell you. <laughs> I kind of never thought it would, but boy, hasn't it. It's just everywhere and frequently now, alas, on the ABC as well. Um, as to the availability of the stuff, we have got hundreds and thousands of photographs and we are compiling, compiling as it were, rap uh, documents which will be online and a few of which will be printed, but we just we just don't have the budget to do it. And in fact, we as our staff is it's it's a festivals have a thing called post festival depression, and normally they're only two weeks, they're two <laughs> two or three weeks. Well, we've had a year of it, and we are experiencing the longest, most difficult time while the work is thundering. I have you know, something like 11 commitments, um, public addresses in the next week, let alone, and the, the program doesn't really finish till mid-December. Um, we've got staff starting to move on to other jobs already. It's starting, so it's a long drawn out. Um, I think at the very end, probably in January, January, there will be four people left that were originally there um, from the beginning. So it's a sad period, but we are, be aware that, you know, I mean, I think kids in particular can, through their schools, access the internet, and it's probably more important for us to maybe send out a wide message to say, have a look at it before it goes. As I said, many things, it's one of the great roles of the national institutions that um, our uh, national library is archiving, at least that probably the Canberra diaspora as well, and a few, one river will be up there for a while. So there will be a lot of evidence. There's And, and still on the website, if you go to the website now, there is a lot to do, but, you know, snap up the books and send them to your friends for sure. Um, I can I can repeat that from here for the benefits of the recording that can, that Queensland has a tourist tea tail um, and one of the ten things listed on it for coming to Queensland is, is that you can't come from Canberra. Welcoming, really. <laughs> uh, can you go to the microphone, please? Thank you. Hello, Robin. Thank you again for your wonderful talk. I'm Barbara Skiles, and I had the great good fortune of working in this building for many years, but I've also had the greatest of pleasure working as a volunteer this year for the Canberra Centenary. Well, so thank, uh, thank again, you. thank you very much for the opportunity of doing that wonderful stuff, because it's been great stuff. And uh, can I ask, uh, will there be a gentle follow-up to this year? Can we not go into a deep despair of moving on from the centenary? Can we not go into that depression, um, but will we be able to, through the Canberra Theatre perhaps, uh, keep bringing wonderful shows from the other states and territories, uh, keeping that wonderful connection going and finding other ways with our Indigenous people to continue telling story of the river and many other opportunities that must be out there to continue to connect Canberra in the strongest possible way. I'm also a Queenslander and I don't have that <laughs> Uh, tea towel. Um, they are still trying to educate family. Uh, but the other, uh, other process is because they can't understand why I live here. Um, but it's only 45 years, so they're slow learners. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we you. understand that. I need my passport every year when I go back uh, to cross over the border. Um, but so I'm also a Canberra tour guide. 
Great. And being able to sell this city to our visitors, um, I still find an extraordinary divide uh, in, in attempting to do that yeah. in a wide I mean, variety I think, of ways. I think because thank of the you. year. I think, thank you for that. And I think because of the year, um, you know, a much easier sell now. I think, the, I think the mood has changed enormously. I will take the opportunity to thank you and all the volunteers. As in any major event, the volunteers in Canberra have been absolutely superb um, and they've really turned out and sort of got lots of good rewards at Windows to the World where suddenly they themselves got to sit at the embassies, inside the embassies and, and have a good time. As to, as to the flow, it's interesting. I did say four years ago, and this is sort of what's happening, is that I didn't think that there should be any kind of big finish to the centenary. Um, uh you know, it's been suggested that any number of events, including the Voices in the Forest, which is at the Arboretum next weekend, and which I hope my virus will spare me to still be able to sing at. Um, uh, it was it was said maybe that could be used as a sort of big um, uh, ending event, and I said all along I didn't want there to be an ending. What I wanted is that by the by the time we hit spring, we would pretty much know whether the year had been a success, and we did, and it was. Um, but by spring, the most healthiest, the, the, the healthiest reflection would be that people were starting to talk about next year and the next 10 and 20 and, and 100 years. And I do think that that's kind of happening. I would rather that there not be an ending as such, but just saying, OK, well, that's been a great year and now we're just moving on. And I think part of the the answer around that is in this change in infrastructure, even though our brief wasn't exactly infrastructure, there's a lot of new stuff gone up. It does look a bit different around the place. But more perhaps significantly is the ephemeral notion of the mood. The mood is definitely up. There has been, I've been saying to a lot of people recently that the the success of a program is very much in the uptake of your audience and your community. Those big books that the uh, the lady before was referring to are a blueprint. You know, they came out, they came out one you know in September and one in in uh, March, to indicate what we'd be doing. But they're just the plan, and so if people don't take it up, then it doesn't exist in a way. And what's been the the, the greatest. Uh, reward as people ask us about, you know, the inevitable KPIs, how do you measure your success? One of my greatest measures of success is that the community responded so generous, generously that they came, that shows and events were booked out, and that they spontaneously did things, that they just did things of their own accord. Not only we had volunteers coming in, but many people proposed projects of their own accord and just went out and did them. One of the most remarkable, of course, is this program um, that was called the Music Musical offering, um, which has seen uh, more than more than I think 600 performances, all free to the public this year, but absolutely one on every day of the year. And I sang myself at the 300th day at the National Portrait Gallery a few weeks ago. So this was just done by citizens. They decided that they were going to have a free musical event every year, and there have been hundreds of those kinds of things. So in a sense, that's the success, and I think that is what's lifted the mood. How how the ACT government leverages off the success is really over to them. That's the next important way of saying, will there be bits of actual things that went on that may be repeated? And Windows to the World is a good example. The parties at the shops is a great example. Um, Daughter of Sky Whale, of course, is what you all want to see. <laughs> I jest. Um, although she is going up in Melbourne, she's had many great subsequent visits and is up in Melbourne on December the uh, December the first or second, I think. Um, but but more for me, what's important is that I know that Canberra quite often, at any change of government, can get a bit gloomy. There's shifts in the public service and employment. What I'd always hope that with a federal election as part of this year, that maybe the buoyant mood of the centenary would keep people's spirits up moving in a rather more positive way and certainly from the, the feedback that I get, that's the case. And what's most important is that so many people have been out and seeing things and there have been so many more visitors to the capital this year so far. That's what we need to preserve. It needs to be that great spirit to carry forth. Somebody very kindly at the Business Council um, the other night, which thanked me uh, at, their, at their gala dinner, thanked me for the work that I'd done and I was at great pains to say, well, I'm just that creature out the front of the ship, um, breasts to the wind, uh, and I've and, and, and very exposed from time to time, I might say. 
but behind me I have a massively well-constructed, beautifully functioning ship of a team that's been responsible really for, for the delivery of this. Um, uh, but somebody expressed to me at that dinner that quite often I, I use the word the infancy of early Canberra. Many people have been talking about its recent history as its adolescence. And somebody said to me the other night, we feel that what the year has done has tipped it from adolescence into that over 18 period. It's actually come of age. It has actually matured. And that, I think, is the hope of the future for the city. Its potential is great. The conversations that the ACT have around the future are very healthy. There is a lot of planning going on and I think just the uplifting of the profile of a good 21st century city in which this house sits and all that major national stuff goes on as well as in the institutions, that's the kind of nice fit that we'd like to see in the future. E equally praised, equally valued. I think we'll have to uh, leave it there. <laughs> We, um, we do have one more Senate occasional lecture coming up this year on the 6th of December and uh, the details are on the website, um, but they're also on brochures that you can pick up on your way out here today. Uh, one of the, I think, key points I'm taking away from today's lecture is that the uh, whingeocracy, that's the technical term, is it, Robin? The whinge, the whingeocracy is in its decline and uh, I, I think we can all uh, embrace that. But yes, please thank me, uh, please join me once more in thanking Robin Archer for a terrific and engaging <laughs> lecture today. Thanks, everyone.